very warm welcome to all of you this afternoon and to our webinar here at SNS. Taking environmental, social and governance considerations into account when investing and making investments decision in the financial market can to many observers play a key role to actually make us go through the transition to a low carbon economy and also to deliver on social and governance goals. And more investors want to build portfolios with companies that do just that, that address issues like climate change and human rights. Welcome to a webinar with Georg Kell, who will talk on the future of sustainability, sustainable investing in the context of decarbonization, digitalization, and a changing global uh, geopolitical environment. Erik Jungberg, head of Group Brand Communication and Sustainability at Swedbank, and Gustav Martinsson, Associate Professor in Financial Economics at the Royal Institute of Technology, will also participate in the discussion. My name is Mia Huna Vransien, and I'm the CEO of SNS. Today's webinar is the first webinar in a new series here at SNS, which is called SNS Sustainability Talks. It is a follow up of the series we had that ran between 2014 and 2018, uh, SNS Sustainability Roundtable, where we had a large number of webinars on the issues um, that we're talking about today, but also many other sustainability issues. One of the keynote speakers that visited us then was Georg Kell, and I'm very, very glad to see him back here at SNS today. You are the founding director of UN Global Compact and served as its director from 2000 to 2015. You oversaw the launch and build up of a number of global initiatives, including the Principles for Responsible Investments, PRI, and the Principles of Responsible Management Education. Today, you are the chair of the board of Arabesque, a tech company that uses AI and big data to assess sustainability performance for investment analysis and decision making. You are also the co-chair of the DWS ESG advisory board and spokesperson of the DW Sustainability Council. Our paths have crossed many times over the last two decades working with sustainability issues, and it's a great joy to see you here with us today. So before we start, uh, as always at SNS, we want the audience to take an active um, part in the discussion. And you do this by asking your question via the Q&A function on your screen. You can start already now if you like. But without further ado, let's start the discussion. Or as I said, a very warm welcome to SNS. Uh, given your very long background in this and in the center of global policy making on business and sustainability, and as a main actor behind many of the most important initiatives, I would like to ask you, which are the main, tre main trends today and what are the main drivers? Please, Gorg. Thank you, Mia, and uh, great to see you over VC and uh, hope in person again soon. Uh, it's a fundamental question because it means trying to answer the question, what makes change happen? How is the world changing? In my reflections, I arrive at three big baselines. Uh, one is technology. Technological change has always been the bedrock of human progress, if you so want but it is now accelerating. Some even talk of exponential growth and our minds find it very difficult to come to grips with that. But technology is man's, humankind's tool by which we change what we do, how we do, and itself the pace is accelerating, number one, and that is unstoppable. Digitalization, artificial intelligence is here to come and will challenge everything we do and how we do it. Number two, the well-known planetary boundaries, anything that has to do with the natural environment, in particular climate change, we all know we have transgressed those boundaries already and nature is already feeding back to us and telling us, look, 
you're about to overstep some really, really dangerous tipping points. And if you continue doing so, uh, your life will be never the same again. And we see the impact already, we feel it. So number two is indeed natural boundaries, in particular climate change, also a long-term force, a structural force, a systemic force. And the third force, more difficult to capture, and it varies greatly by region, is governance, social, political changes, which uh, I think at the baseline also follow the other two trends, but which play out in different leads and lags across the globe. So you have some countries where young people increasingly demand climate action. You have other countries where young people are still tied up in dysfunctional uh, failing states. So these are the three forces that change the framework conditions for investors and for business. These are the framework conditions within business and investors compete and try to survive and succeed. And coming to grips with technology and planetary boundaries uh, means making radical changes in terms of adopting avant-garde decarbonization strategies, switching to smart analytics, being more data-driven, and basically moving from an industrial era mindset towards a future fit mindset, which we can't yet describe in detail, but we know that the future has to be decarbonized, meaning negative carbon will become a new currency, a future where uh, new lifestyles and healthier well-being has another value as it has today, and a new lifestyle and a new way of market behavior where we reestablish a healthy relationship with the natural environment. Our systems are not yet there. Our evaluation is still based on the old assessments. So we have to adopt, we have to build bridges into the future, and we have to try to be ahead of the curve rather than being squeezed by the curve. But in, in the basic analysis, I think it's fair to say that we are living through a momentous transformation where we shape the future depending on how we deal with technological change, planetary boundaries, and how we can carry the people around us with, with it. So it is a very exciting uh, time to be in, I believe. We have to throw away many of our old mindsets because what we used to learn at university or school, our linear thinking is no longer adequate. We have to anticipate much more rapid discontinuity. We have to anticipate uh, changes that we cannot predict just by looking back in the past. We have to build uh, resilience into the future, but we know where the basic pathways are, decarbonization, uh, green electricity, uh, changing valuation, which puts a premium on future fit practices and assets and moving away from those which destroy. I think this is at the very aggregate level, uh, a systems description with the three underlying forces. Each of these forces, by the way, is irreversible. So it's not a trend, it's not a fashion trend that comes and goes. Uh, remember when we started sustainability 20 years ago, it was an add-on. Uh, it is now in the boardrooms. It is strategically of, of utmost importance. Uh, it's irreversible. Technological change, often neglected by sustainability advocates, has always been and now ever is more a key driver. It not only changes the processes by which we evaluate and we value, but it also itself offers the solution we so urgently need to move away from one method to better method. Uh, so technology has this dual functionality, being a disruptor on the one hand, but also offering the solutions. So that is my, my most aggregate uh, analysis. Thank you very much. You describe these three important parts of the framework, changing framework as you describe it. How has it impacted on, you know, on the ground in terms of trends or maybe a, 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 a strong trends here to stay in the field of, of actually 
uh, capital going towards uh, uh, sustainable investments? Has yeah. It, are they yeah. in tandem? No, I would still claim that the real economy businesses who produce, who uh, offer services and products were at the forefront of this change because they were hit first. It took finance a bit longer. I still feel guilty for sometimes for having convinced Kofi Annan to send out invitations to about 40 asset owners to create a working group in 2003 called Who Cares Wins? And they coined that term ESG and then we launched PRI. Uh, finance came a bit later historically. Of course, ethical finance, finance has always existed. Uh, it had, or has always been a part, but it was driven purely by moral consideration negative screening. Now, what was the new trend is that environmental social governance issues were recognized to have material relevance, to be financially relevant, not yet necessary today, but at some point in the future. And therefore, if you have a long-term perspective, you better come to grips with it. Uh, I think ESG, sustainable investing, took really off around 2014 once a relationship was established between long-term valuation, a positive one, and the ability to proactively manage these factors. Many studies came out from Harvard and elsewhere, and that has really whetted the appetite of Wall Street and Shanghai and all over the world. And today, uh, almost over a third of uh, professionally managed asset under management has some alignment with ESG factors. So rapidly growing, uh, totally in, in, in a fragmented way uh, with accusations of greenwashing and all the imperfections we know of, but the mindsets have changed, the goal setting has changed, the language is changing, and now the processes and the data and ultimately the valuation will change too. So it's a very uneven process uh, just a little anecdote, few people will know about this. In 2012, uh, uh, a good friend launched with Bloomberg and others and NGOs uh, an effort to accredit rating agencies with the aim of making sustainability rating more coherent and give it <laughs> more quality. And uh, he gave up in 2017 because the jungle was just exploding 600 ratings and uh, approaches and no willingness for coherence or quality assurance. Um, uh, the field was too much in evolution. My argument is it's still a young field. Uh, it's still uh, just barely 10 years young and it took financial accounting decades to arrive at clear definitions, uh, ESG, measurement and standards are in rapid evolution. And there are some important trends we will come to, I will talk about in a moment, where I do believe the current backlash uh, that is partly politically motivated, especially coming out from Wall Street, if I may say so, uh, is uh, temporary. It will help uh, the imperfections to, to improve, to find better ways forward. And I have no doubt that over time, ESG factors will ultimately fully, fully find their way into pricing. In a way, you can think about ESG factors as a bridge into the future, a bridge that tries to anticipate what is not yet reflected in uh, everybody's today's assessment, but a future we know with scientific certainty will come. So finance is on the move massively. We have all these major announcements, net zero asset management alignment. Uh, PRI has record numbers of, of participants, uh, hundreds of working groups now working towards COP26 uh, with goal setting and net zero by 2050 and by 2030 so much. So the frameworks, are, it's all gearing up, but it's still, <laughs> there's still some important work to be done. It's still messy. It's still messy. Could I ask you, um, you talk about a new technology and AI and, and, and big data. Um, how could that assist in actually helping practitioners on the financial markets, academics and regulators and everyone who's working with really highly imperfect and sometimes contradictory data? 
What, what's happening? I mean, is it? Yes, let me give a, a general uh, reply first, uh, where I think the trends are going to. Uh, there are several trends coming together now. One is indeed technology. And I don't want to do self-advertisement, but by December, we will launch a radically new platform which focuses on raw data and forward-looking information. We hope it will disrupt the market and make uh, quality ESG information much more widely available. Technology is the enabler for that. You couldn't do it without technology because once you have raw data sufficiently, you can be agnostic towards frameworks. And then the ownership, if you're those who disclose, can actually play towards all stakeholders. It's a huge new model that is emerging. And that is thanks to technology. There's a second trend, very powerful too, and that is regulation. The European Union with uh, its taxonomy and related requirements is increasingly defining a minimum floor. And I expect that at COP26, something similar will happen, hopefully on emissions in particular. The SEC has started uh, a working group uh, the International Financial Institute for Sustainability Rating is finally also about to launch a working group. So there is talk about more coherence also from the standard setter, and it will over time happen. But the regulator's approach is really significant because it defines a minimum floor of basic ESG information that corporations have to comply with. And that changes the rules of the game. That means sustainability information will be a public good as it should be. And so we see technology as being a key driver. We see regulation being a key driver. And we also see trends by major standard setters to create more coherence. So I do expect that within the next couple of months, these trends will actually uh, overcome many of the current deficiencies and improve the quality of ESG information, it will help to accelerate its mainstreaming in analysis and decision-making, and it will ultimately help to change pricing itself. Because unless it's reflected in prices, it will just stay an add-on. Uh, could I ask you on that, on pricing, um, in an op-ed in Forbes earlier this year, um, you stated that, that climate change cannot be uh, mitigated without effective carbon pricing. Uh, and, but as we all know, progress on that is very slow. And uh, given that fact, how far can you come in, with actions on, in sustainable, sustainability investing and finance? Well, as you know, Mia, many economists have long argued the simplest way to deal with climate change is to price externalities. Nature has subsidized our business models for generations. We no longer can afford that. The world still pays $5 trillion every year to subsidize fossil fuel production and consumption. Total investment in renewable energy is only one-tenth of that or even less. So we still haven't adjusted our industrial era policy frameworks to the new requirements. So we have to continue making the case. Sweden has successfully introduced a carbon price very early on, 91 or so, and Gus Gustav will tell us, I guess, more about it. We should not give up. Politicians often hide behind the argument that carbon pricing would hurt the less well-off more. Therefore, we cannot risk it. The Yellow Vest example sometimes called it Hamburg nonsense. First of all, the poor will always be most impacted by climate change. Look who drowned in New York. It's the woman with their child in the basement. It's not the rich people living on the hill. So <laughs> not acting on climate change proactively means neglecting the priorities of the poor. Secondly, a carbon tax is progressive by nature because the richer you are, the bigger your carbon footprint by definition. And thirdly, if social concerns were really the concerns of policymakers as they pretended to be, uh, then clearly with direct compensation or other fiscal means, any potential disadvantage can easily be balanced out. So we should not give up on carbon pricing. Uh, I think it's an essential tool. Uh, Yellen has said so, all leading economists have said so for decades. Uh, we have to continue making that case. 
And probably now with the European Union being so courageous in that space, for the first time, I think we have an opportunity to work on a geopolitical level to advance that thinking. And uh, my friend Ottmar and Johan from Potsdam Climate Institute recently went public. I fully support that thinking, working towards a G3, Europe, US and China minimum floor for carbon pricing and then having a built-in mechanism, a race to the top, keeping the doors open for other major markets to join in. But the G3 has to become a reality uh, if we want to have a chance of, of uh, making a real difference there. I was just going to ask about that, how the geopolitics and the trends uh, of that, uh, what, what impact it could have on, on, on these important issues. Uh, do we have to come to a very serious situation before something happens? Uh, how, what do you think? Yeah, I'm actually, I have to try to stay optimistic, okay? <laughs> because people say if you are pessimistic, <laughs> uh, nobody listens to you anymore. But uh, frankly, uh, I'm quite often very pessimistic because we can witness right now the emergence of a new Cold War, meaning old power concepts are still very much alive. And in the end, power trumps market logic, always has historically. And our power concepts haven't been innovated in 2000 years. This sphere of influence thinking and being stronger than your potential enemy still is the number one priority of those who have power. And those who have power don't wanna give up power for the sake of power irrespective how well or not well of people are. So we have a real problem there in terms of our mindsets in humanity that we have not evolved in our power conceptualization. <laughs> That's, uh, I know this is, doesn't sound, it sounds a bit outlandish, but I'm very concerned about the emergence or the possibility of new Cold Wars. I hope at COP26, the US and China in particular will rediscover collaboration Remember, Paris was relatively a success, primarily because the US and China were willing to collaborate. If big power recognizes we have a common challenge, a common enemy, we can change the world. If they have other priorities, then whatever other priorities other people have will not be the top priorities in the world. So we have to make climate change a systemic threat to world security. Uh, hopefully win over foreign policy thinkers as well, that they have to change their mindsets towards another threat. Uh, right now, I'm not very optimistic, to be honest, because on a daily basis, uh, it looks like uh, the confrontation has become more of a Cold War thing. Uh, and it reminds me very much of the last Cold War, uh, the language, the attitude, uh, the blaming of the others. Uh, so hopefully that will not happen. Hopefully midterm elections next year in the US will provide a new consensus on, on climate change so that that issue will also nationally become even more important. Uh, currently in the US, we only see deficit spending. We don't see behavioral change. Uh, unfortunately, President Biden has made it very explicit he insists that Americans keep on having cheap gas uh, by definition, and that is not necessarily a good basis to, to bring about systems change. <clears throat> uh, so one has to stay optimistic and uh, arguably a new book my friends from Finland put out, I'll send you the link uh, afterwards. Uh, they asked the question, how big does a real climate impact have to be? before we really recognize the emergency we are in. And who defines on the criteria then, what the criteria of such a crisis are? And then how do we respond? And uh, probably there are three possible scenario. One is obviously the hothouse earth, which unfortunately more and more people embrace because it's placed also into fear, uh, chaos, mass migration, and so forth social unrest. The second one is the ban economy, because once governments are forced to take bolder actions, they tend to be very harsh then, they just forbid, they ban certain things at high costs. Or the third option, still the preferred one, would be obviously a managed transition, 
where policy incentives shift accordingly, externalities are priced, and we succeed in moving towards decarbonization in time before popular unrests and other major disruptions force our hands. The future is in our hands, so to speak. It depends what actions we take now. Thank you. Uh, I would like to put a question to you from, from the audience. It's Eric today, and now we go coming back actually to, you know, what can we do given where we are uh, in terms of, of, of uh, working towards the towards um, what you have been describing here in terms of the need to, to get the, the emissions down. Uh, Eric Tadin, he said, he, many, including myself, advocate some kind of global price on carbon, maybe the tax, which might be difficult politically, as Mia said, an alternative, an alternative would be for investors to push for companies in which they invest to publish the internal CO2 price they use to guide its businesses. I remember being at a, a conference in New York uh, with Global Compact on internal carbon pricing. And there was a lot of hush hush there in terms of what, what actually the prices were for those who had one. What do you say about that idea? I think corporates in many regards are ahead of regulators and uh, societal overall preferences. Uh, voluntary initiatives, uh, carbon pricing, uh, are very, very important. We see innovation uh, competing with the old models. Um, so for, in my mind, voluntary initiatives never can be a substitute, obviously, for societal change and ultimately policy change, but they prepare the ground for. They can make it easier for policymakers to jump on. Now that the green investment is moving so rapidly now that venture capital goes into green steel, into circular economy, into uh, anything that connects digital with sustainability. Uh, politicians ultimately understand that uh, this is the way of things to come. And this is where we have to move to. So it prepares the ground for, it makes arguments, it demonstrates viability maybe on a small modest uh, space, but still the, the bigger the scale, the bigger the impact. So ultimately very, very important with voluntary initiatives and self-declared uh, uh, good intentions always comes then the risk of being accused of uh, doing too much marketing and not enough action. But as the disclosure frameworks around sustainability are getting tighter over time, I think it's a self-reinforcing uh, uh, constellation. And for the first time that investors are now finally, finally really understanding that climate risks are for real and they can wipe out whole asset classes and that it's time to come to grips with climate risk seriously. So we have now an alignment of finance and of business working in similar directions and there's a major, major new playground, uh, which hopefully will make it much, much easier for policymakers to change the framework conditions. Thank you, Gorg. Now it's time for uh, inviting our two panelists into the discussion. First, Erik Jungberg, uh, you are the head of group brand communication and sustainability and joined Swedbank in this role last year in July and you are a member of the group executive uh, committee. And before that, uh, for over 20 years at Scania, you held several roles, including senior vice president of communication, brand and marketing, and senior vice president of corporate, uh, corporate relations. You bring knowledge both from banking and from industry. We're very happy to have you here. So I would like to start by asking you uh, this question. Uh, we have talked about uh, uh, sustainable investing. How big is the potential of the banking sector in playing an important role in supporting ESG goals and targets, not only on the invest investment side, but also under other activities such as lending? And I think um, you, are, you are doing a lot of work on that at Swedbank. So please, what are your ideas on that? Yeah, thank you, Mia. Uh, it's great to be here to say a couple of words. Um, as you know, we have a 200 years history where we 
help normal people uh, to um, save their money and then we use that money to be uh, lended then to, to companies. So we have been part of uh, developing uh, the Swedish society and now we're also part then of, the, of the Baltic countries, of course. And as you're into uh, the asset management, this is one part to influence, of course, uh, that uh, the companies you own are taking the right measures on the ESG area, but also on the lending side, of course, where we have the great opportunity because equity can always change. I mean, you, if you sell a share, it be, will be bought by someone else. But when it comes to lending, you can, of course, stop that immediately, especially you can also uh, direct it to the right investments, uh, both for new startups, but also, of course, for, for helping uh, uh, companies to, to transform them. Uh, so so I, I think the banking sector and the financial sector has a huge uh, role to play here. Um, if everyone stops financing certain industries, of course, that industry will die. Uh, but um, Kell was into it, that that's not um, how it can be done either. So. Um, I also would like to express that I think also we have an, another great role. We have some 7 million customers, uh, 4 million in Sweden and uh, 3 in the Baltic countries. And of course, we have a huge opportunity also through advisory um, to take a step in that area to really help our customers, both privates, but also corporates to take steps in the right direction. And if we do that, we have a fantastic multiplying effect then. Um, we are also extremely... Uh, Gio, you were into the social politics, the social um, uh, unrest. Uh, we have a situation now where it's very easy to buy things you really don't need. And uh, uh, for the ones financing that, you shouldn't pay the bills on time either. So we have a situation where also a lot of young people then go out to, to the adult world uh, with a big debt. So I, I saw a figure of some 32,000 young people starting their grown-up life uh, on with debt, with a huge debt with the Swedish Enforcement uh, Authority. Then. So I also would like to, to add one letter to the ESG, and that's the F, that's financial sustainability, uh, that you really help people to, to have a financial sustainability as well. Thank you, Gustav. Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Uh, now it's time to ask Gustav to come in. Gustav Martinsson, please. Uh, you are, as I said in the beginning, Associate Professor in Financial Economics and Head of Accounting, Finance, Economics and Organization Division at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. You are also a Visiting Research Fellow at Swedish House of Finance at Stockholm School of Economics. And there you teach uh, sustainable finance um, in executive education and also you teach that um, it's just on it's sustainable finance at, at, at the uh, Royal Institute of Technology. So most welcome, Gustav. Thank you. Um, so I would like to start by asking you, what does research tell us about the impact on the ESG goals and targets, the end goals of sustainable finance, sustainable investing initiatives? and the regulation that has been introduced. What do we know? Have they led to reductions in greenhouse gas emissions or in the social or governance goals that they might have been directed towards? Have they led, what do we know about if they have led to operational changes within companies? Please, Gustav. Thank you. Uh, well, it's a big question. Um, uh, so, I mean, most of the research on ESG in, in the finance field to date has been about more of it as a kind of an asset class and whether it's it's tying ESG rating different stocks and companies or, or mutual funds on an ESG rating and then checking the financial return of these investments, which is interesting and, and typically it points to that that has a positive return uh, on on. Uh, on well, stocks or, or mutual funds, but there's surprisingly little or no evidence on what the actual goal from the start or the actual motivation of ESG that, uh, or, or to have a more of a sustainable perspective, that would be to, we want to reduce emissions. We want to have a more socially sustainable corporate sector, but the evidence of actually linking uh, a 
firms ESG performance to an actual outcome such as e, uh, emissions reductions is well non-existing actually. Uh, there's very little research or not, not any research actually I know that actually points to that, which I, it needs to take that additional step to, to actually tie something that has been, I think, shown to, to positively impact financial returns uh, and tie that to environmental outcomes, but also operational uh, outcomes at the corporate level. Do firms actually change uh, relative to uh, their ESG scores? Or is it so that investors prefer certain stocks with high ESG and that it's a financial flow rather than some change at the real level at, at the company level. And we know very little about that. And I think that's, that would be, uh, hopefully more research is, is, is coming up uh, in, in that sphere. It's always hard uh, when there is a lack of research, uh, because if you say that there is no proof for it, people kind of think that that is because research has shown that there is no proof for it. And uh, maybe the cause is that we just haven't researched it. So can you uh, talk on that? But also, uh, given the fact that there is not much research on those issues, uh, what are the impediments? Is it a lack of data? Is it a lack of financing such research? Or is it a lack of researchers? Please, Gustav. I guess it's a combination. I, I don't think it's a lack of researchers. Uh, well, it was a lack of researchers today. Now it's a lot of activity going on. Uh, it's it's for sure a lack of data, and it's a lack of it's a lack of kind of comprehensive data. Given that it's, it's um, very little regulation in the field, and as a researcher, you like regulation if it's mandatory because then uh, you get data across the board and you can compare everyone. But if it's voluntary data, then you only get data for the ones that already are doing well and want to show the world that they're doing well. So then it's kind of hard to compare. Um, so it's oftentimes with these ESG scores that you capture really well run companies that they are well governed, they, they score highly and they are, you tend to have the, 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 the least emitting firms in a the sector. They want to disclose their emissions, but the ones that emit more, they don't want to disclose their emissions. So it, then it becomes tricky to kind of really compare and analyze what's actually going on. Uh, so it's, uh, but, but a lack of data, that's, that's one of a, that's a kind of general problem, I would say. So how can that be solved? Can new technology and big data and AI uh, assist? Um, to some extent, uh, I mean, I'm not an expert in all the details what actually they can do, but I think if, if, it's, if it's a lack of actual raw data of actually knowing what, and it's not just, I mean, it's also how to collect it and, and to knowing uh, kind of across the entire kind of production of let's say a company, how much it emits. It actually, then the company needs to kind of sort, I mean, collect that data and someone needs to collect it. I mean, in Sweden, we have had a tax for a long time. That's the, the benefit of a tax in, in terms of research is that then someone actually collects the data on, on the emissions. Uh, so maybe that would be one way of just having, even those who are very reluctant to impose a carbon tax, just impose a super small carbon tax so we at least know the scope of it. So we actually have to collect the data. That's one, one positive thing is now with the UETS that we at least now have back to 2005 data for the large emitters in EU. So we know at least how much they've emitted. Um, but I think it's, a, it's it becomes, a, we need to have, the evidence if, if, if kind of carbon pricing and these regulations work, but for, to know, to get that evidence, we need to have a tax to have something to evaluate. So it becomes a bit of a uh, catch 22. Thank you, uh, Gustav. Please all of you join the screen. And I really want to urge the audience also to put questions. Um, and I will start by giving Georg the chance to if he likes, comment on what you have heard from Eric and Gustav before I open up with more question, questions. Yeah, no, I, I'm also very, very impatient, uh, frankly, and uh, the older I get, the more impatient I, I do get. I, I, for me, it's just hard to justify why in the year 2021, we still cannot measure probably emissions. Uh, I mean, we all know what emissions do to the climate, 
we all know uh, where the problem is. It has been known for decades. And still, we don't even have basic information on emissions. So I, I think pushing regulators now to come clear on that. And for the reasons I mentioned before, regulators manage often the status quo and they're very populistic and short term and they, they hide behind the arguments of social coherence when in reality they're doing just the opposite. So I think I understand why young people are really impatient there. Uh, and But I think it will change now quite radically and fast. I mean, the European Union is, is really moving courageously fast on these issues. So uh, that will help. Uh, and then this daring proposal of a border adjustment, uh, it will force the world to, to take a position then. And so long as it's not being abused for protectionist uh, causes, I, I think as the economists concluded, it's not only morally, Something happened there. We tried to fix it. Uh, and meanwhile, I think I give the floor to, uh, I want to ask, uh, picking up on what Georg just left with, uh, the regulation, the need for more regulation and, and um, disclosure. Um, we have a lot of, a whole forest of voluntary initiatives and uh, it doesn't seem like there's a convergence uh, of much. And uh, I was wondering, when you talk to the people you meet where you are in terms of your this executive education and your, 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 your clients at the bank, how do they feel about the voluntary approach or a regulatory approach? Yeah, I, I think we, we start to talk about that the self-regulation or the time of self-regulation is, is over and we, we start to see that things are moving now, especially in, in Europe as uh, years into. And uh, of course, it will be very difficult uh, from the beginning to um, apply with this because we, we don't have the facts, we don't have the data. Uh, but I personally believe and um, we believe it's the, the way to go forward, of course, and, and do that in very close cooperation uh, between us and, and the regulators. So we, we get good regulation in place, of course, um, and especially that you get regulation in place that is accelerating what we would like to accelerate um, because sometimes regulation can be stopping of course and, and breaking everything but this is something we are looking into and we, and we are welcoming that it's it's we're coming away from this self-regulation because then it could be much much clearer for our customers also uh, and then we can help the customers to take the, the, the better decision within this area. Gustav you wanted regulation to, in order to get data so you could do research <laughs> to, to find out what works. No, but um, when you meet people uh, in, in your teaching uh, who are executives and, and you know, in charge of, 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 of big companies, what do they feel about this? Well, I think they're a bit kind of, which I think is the, one of the underlying problems that I don't think every, I think most people prefer voluntary. I mean, generally in life, you would like everything to be voluntary. And to the, I don't think everyone appreciates the, that it can become problematic if it's not. Uh, and when you move it toward not having it voluntary, then you start, well, do we really want that solution or that solution or that solution? And that kind of it, then people start to maybe oppose that particular solution. Um, so it's, I, I think I, I hear, I think my, my general response is that I don't think everyone really appreciates what it actually means to move from voluntary to mandatory because then you have then it's a regulation that you, everyone has to abide to and then it becomes a bit different um, could i ask you on you know on this thing of disclosure um i guess uh you know looking back in the history of, of these issues uh, the nordic companies have always been at the forefront in a, and in actually uh, working with these issues but at the same time, be quite reluctant in, in, in showing off that they're doing that. And uh, very early on, uh, I think it was the cause for that was that they wanted to have everything you know, in place before you actually go out and tell the market or, or the consumers that things are working. Um, is that something which is kind of changing or is it still, maybe I should ask you, it's good to have you back, Georg. Uh, I was talking about the Nordic companies and the Nordic model I know you often get back to uh, in terms of, uh, you know, being very uh, upfront when working with these issues, 
But at the same time, I still feel that companies are reluctant to actually go out and, and, and kind of advertise it too much. Well, not too much, I mean, it's, um, you know, in, in accordance with what they're actually doing because they, they know they can get it back uh, in terms of that people complain about things they are not doing. And this is not, it's very hard to get up to 100% in this issue. What do you say, Georg? Nordic model. Yeah, no, I'm a great fan of, uh, of Nordic model. Uh, quite frankly, I think it's not perfect, obviously, because even more could be done. <laughs> and uh, I, would, I would wish that uh, Swedish companies in particular now had the courage to step forward and, uh, for example, on ESG data and uh, make a move and say, look, uh, we are now ready. We know decarbonization is the way to go. Uh, uh, we know regulation is still lagging behind, but uh, we make a move now. So that's my wish. But I'm a great uh, supporter and fan for a related reason, because I also always found in the Nordic world uh, this openness towards technology, which in other European countries, for example, often is a barrier. There are structural issues, you know, uh, often hold back transformation or old uh, systems, hierarchical and so forth. Uh, whereas in the Nordic world, I always found the spirit of innovation is being cultivated and more and more companies have discovered. For example, I mean, I can say this, Eric, within the Volkswagen Group, which is a global corporation, Scania was the lead model. Yeah? And uh, I've pushed for the Scania approach to be known and understood by Skoda in Czech Republic, by Seat in Spain, uh, in China, and not to embrace sustainability as a mega trend and not just out of a manager of a communications department, just for an example. Yeah. So no doubt uh, Nordics have really reason to, to feel confident, and but I wish they were more open now and transparent also on the data side. I understand if you are headquartered in, in the Nordic world, you're a bit reluctant to over-advertise your ESG credentials in the international sphere because that might create some backlash out of Texas or Shanghai. <laughs> but uh, if done smartly, I think uh, that's my wish. On carbon pricing, Gustav knows much more about the subject. I mean, the Swedish experience, uh, I hope it would inspire the European Union even more and win over also southern countries and eastern countries, that structural change is possible. You can do it socially uh, inclusive. So keep up your, your innovation spirit. Keep up uh, the willingness to push, push forward, even if the rest of the continent is still a little bit behind. So yes, and uh, Scania has done a great book on, on Sweden, uh, which <laughs> recently on the Swedish model, I, I think it's true. I really believe it's true. I just hope you can sustain that spirit of, of innovation. Uh, so. Okay, may I just add some advertisement here for Gustav Martinsons and Per Strömberg's uh, paper for SNS, which was actually looking into the black box, so to speak, within companies, how carbon pricing affected their decisions. Uh, and I know in the circles who are really into the issue, it has been very much, um, you know, uh, it's the first time as I understand almost in the world where you actually have that date and actually do it. Gustav, can you just one word, short word on that one? Well, I mean, it's, it's surprisingly not very many people have looked at actually measuring the impact of carbon pricing. And we do that using the entire time series of Swedish data and firms and really show that it works. So. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Very powerful. <laughs> could I could I end? Uh, no, well, I have two questions I really want to ask. What, they're kind of very different. Um, one kind of goes back to, um, you know, the whole world type of issues. We have had a very, uh, an exceptional low interest rate environment for, for a long time. And uh, I was wondering, or we, uh, you know, what do you think about some, if interest rates starts going up again? Do you think that could impact on the demand and supply of sustainable investing? Do you think there's a link here? Oh, yeah, yeah I, I'm quite convinced there is. I mean, many of the deficit spending now is actually, I would argue, a wasted opportunity because it's not being used to restructure and make future-proof our economies. Most of the money countries have been spending now 
is just to make everybody feel good, uh, not to feel any adjustment need on, on sustainability issues, for example. So huge buildup of deficits we leave behind for the next generation also a dead mountain, not only a destroyed planet, but also dead. I think it's partly irresponsible. Uh, and on the valuation, I'm pretty sure that the long-term issues of uh, sustainability uh, will continue to gain relevance, even in a higher inflation environment. Uh, how it will play out by industry needs to be seen. But we have seen various cycles in the past 20 years uh, of ups and downs with easy money and then contraction and inflation. And through all these phases, the core long-term trends of sustainability have grown. I remember financial crisis, the issue was now, this is the end of the sustainability movement, 2009. Uh, on the contrary, the opposite was true. The corporates realized, the investors realized, back to basic, what really matters, what does long-term success mean? It was actually a wake-up call. So I expect something similar to happen also in the case of higher inflation. Someone else has comment. I have a question also here from the audience. Gustav, did you have a comment? Or shall I go? No, I think you would summarize yeah. it. Well, so thank you. How about you, Eric? Shall I? No, I, I, I don't go into the interest rate uh, discussion, but I, I definitely think we, we need more knowledge what uh, the um, sustainability question will, will lead to when it comes to, to risk and uh, reward. Uh, and also then the question about stranded assets. Uh, how do you take geographical risks into your credit uh, process? Uh, where do the factories uh, uh, be, uh, where are they placed? Uh, will they be flooded and so on? I mean, there, there are lots of questions that will have financial impact going forward and that 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 knowledge we need to to grasp because what you see you act on um if you compare the discussion on, on carbon uh, co2 or nuclear uh, you see a nuclear catastrophe but you haven't seen the co2 challenge yet but now you start to see that will that change our minds going forward investing in in other type of of energy supply for example Thank you. I have a question here from Philippa Lindström uh, uh, for Gero Kell. Do you think that G3 will be, uh, uh, will be able to agree on limiting uh, GHG? And if so, what are the necessary requirements to reach an agreement? Big issue. And then you have an even bigger one. Uh, do you think that the capitalistic system that comes from a shareholder value perspective needs to be upgraded to a capitalist that is more long term? Short term versus long term. If yeah. so, how can that be done? You choose, yeah. you have two minutes, one minute. <laughs> two on minutes you have. Yeah, on the first one, I don't have the answer. It's my wishful thinking. I, I may write an, an outlandish opinion piece on that because I fear people and power, the concepts are still myths of the past and people haven't really learned those in power and foreign policy. So I'm not very optimistic, but I think the hands will be forced. China will feel the impact. Uh, US, we know what's going on there from water to fire to flooding. Uh, so it's bound to come. In which form it will come, I don't know. I outlined three scenarios how it could unfold, uh, but nobody knows the future. Uh, the more we can contribute, the better. The more we can build bridges between the US and China, the better, I would argue. Uh, on on the, uh, the long-term, short-term, this is really a fixed issue because uh, multi-dimensional time thinking is not really our strength. Our strength is also not to think in exponential terms as many changes are exponential by nature now. So uh, uh, we just have to keep on uh, moving ahead. And uh, there are very smart people out there who, who already develop now decision-making um, uh, uh, based on different timelines. So thinking at least not only in a short, but also in the long term. And the tragedy of the horizon, uh, our inability to think long term and to discount future costs and benefits as if they were happen tomorrow is a human bias. We're all complicit in that. I think we all, the pe people want instant gratification uh, and so forth. 
but now we have to realize that there are some fundamentals we have to correct. So yes, uh, the more capitalism is, is long-term oriented, the better. Uh, the more long-term we think, we act, we evaluate, the better. Absolutely. But I don't have the golden recipe on how to make that happen. <laughs> I wish I had. <laughs> so uh, with those words, and I think they're very good words, because that's something we, I think we, we can come back to with such in the near future, thinking about these issues and discussing this issue of long-term versus short-term. I really want to thank you all. And uh, I think you raised so many questions today uh, that need to be discussed in much further detail, but also gave us such a good example of what's actually are happening, is happening all over the place. And uh, I want to end by just um, put, uh, say, uh, reading out from a note from Eric Tudien on one of the issues we talked about today. And, that, and he writes, EU is pushing hard for mandatory dis disclosure and it will happen. SEC is also pushing in the same direction and globally IFRC has taken important initiatives to create a global base for disclosure on ESG. And IOCCO is working close with IFRC. You, <laughs> this is hard, but it is, it, but uh, we will try to send this out for you later. So we will have much more comparable, regula comparable regulation in coming years. And this will be an important subject at COP26. Thank you, Eric, for updating us, us on that. So very much a thank you to all of you. And uh, I want to just end uh, with uh, telling you what's coming ne next in our series uh, on SNS Sustainability Talks. On October 21, it will be on business and human rights. We have talked very much about environment today and specific, specifically climate change. We, I think that's where you often end up because that's where most things are happening, but things are happening on the business and human rights side too. Caroline Rees, president and co-founder of SHIFT, internationally renowned as the leading center of expertise on the UN guiding principles on business and human rights is coming here. She was the lead advisor on the team of Professor John Ruggie, the special rep representative of the UN Secretary General on Business and Human Rights, and was deeply involved in drafting the guiding principles. So hope to see you then and uh, welcome back. And thank you once again to all of you.